Killer Cross-Examination, a podcast by your host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockine. Hey everyone, it's Neil Rockine, your host of Killer Cross-Examination. If, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you apologized for something you didn't do? I think we've all been in, in that situation with a parent, with a child, with an employer, where you're faced with a choice of having to, to continue to deny that you did something, knowing that that was the truth, but knowing that the path ahead was going to be difficult and complicated, costly, um, and, and emotionally painful. And instead of opting to do that, you continue, you, you did the opposite. You, you apologized. You took responsibility. You sucked it up. You, you, you said something that you knew wasn't true. But you did it because you thought at that exact moment in time, that was the best way to alleviate the pressure of feeling like you um, had this horrible choice. And you thought in that particular moment in time, if I just agree and say that I did something, I'll be able to fix it down the road. If you have, you're not alone. One of the most fascinating things that I have found that I have seen and one of the things that I think generates the most controversy in the criminal justice system are false confessions. My guest um, today is, is, is Jim Trainum, formerly James Trainum. Um, I would say that he is a, an expert in police interrogation techniques. Jim, welcome to Killer Cross-Examination. Well, thank you for having me. And I don't think I've heard a better explanation of false confessions in everyday life than what you just gave. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I've thought long and hard about this subject because I think one of the things that, that people who hear about false confessions, their first reaction is, come on, right? Their first reaction is, can't be. I right. mean, who would admit to a serious crime that they didn't commit? And the answer is anybody who is put into this situation uh, where we are trained to make you extremely vulnerable and do this cost benefit analysis that you were talking about um, right there. And, and Jim, I want to I want to take some time to because um, I wanted to jump right into this subject. I think it's so important. It's so critical that the legal system opens the public's eyes to the acceptability that there are false confessions that occur and that they result in catastrophic results in the legal system. Um, and I think that there's no better person that I can think of to begin that discussion for me than talking to you. And so I think people should know that you're not just some hippie, liberal, uh, social justice warrior, who's approaching this thing from that standpoint. So tell me a little bit about your, your background and what makes you, why would I think, knowing your background as I do, that you're someone who is intimately familiar with police interrogation techniques and their potential catastrophic consequences? Well, as um, for 27 years, I was with the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C., uh, over half of that, I was with the homicide unit. And I was trained in the standard interrogation uh, practices. I've been through numerous courses uh, through my, let's say my career. And, um, you know, basically I've interrogated God knows how many uh, suspects, witnesses, uh, let's say uncooperative people, things along that line. And it was back in 1994, actually, that I was using the standard interrogation techniques that I was taught, that I actually was able to convince a woman that it was in her best interest to confess to a crime that she had nothing to do with. Not only that, she was able to provide us with all of these details about the crime that, as we say, only the true killer would know. Um, what happened was she was charged. We went ahead with our investigation. And during that uh, follow-up investigation, we found her alibi and her alibi was unshakable. 
And as we went back and re-looked at the original reason why she became a suspect, we found that the grounds that we uh, belie believed was firm actually wasn't. The forensic evidence that we thought we had turned out not to be as accurate as, as we thought. So we had to, of course, release her. Um, so what I wanted to do was I wanted to find out what did I do um, that caused her to believe that it was a good idea to confess to a crime she didn't commit. And how did she know all those details? So I learned from my mistakes by studying other false confessions, by reading what the experts said, by learning about things like confirmation bias, where it's it's kind of like a tunnel vision where you, you know, are so convinced in what you think is the truth that you only look for evidence to confirm that. And you know, the thing is, you might think I'm a you know, bleeding heart liberal and all that, but I wanted to take that and use that for my colleagues to, you know, uh, start a training program to help them avoid the same mistakes that I made and thus actually, you know, create better investigations. My goal throughout, you know, my police career and what I've done since then is not to bash law enforcement. Law enforcement has a tough job to begin with. Uh, false confessions are typically not the uh, result of some rogue police officer, but they're by well-meaning police officers who are working with the information that they have, the training that they have, but they're not being taught some of the side effects of their techniques that they're using. They're not being taught how to identify problems. And uh, so therefore they're getting off track in a lot of cases. So yeah, my goal is the best investigations possible. I wanna unpack that. That's, th there's a lot to unpack there. And I wanna go back to what you started to say in the beginning was that you were a homicide detective in Washington, DC, is that right? That's correct. And um, how many investigations did you take part in um, with the, the Washington, D.C. Police Department? Uh, I've never kept track of the numbers, but either as primary, secondary, or in some sort of supporting role, probably a few hundred right there. Now, that's only a homicide stuff. I'm also did a lot of investigative work in other areas as well. So how many of those cases involved the the um, uh, in, in obtaining or generating a confession from an accused? Uh, at least probably about 25 percent right that's there. A lot. I mean, that's a lot. So those are that's a that's a significant number, in my opinion. But not only that, but you have to remember that if we have a witness who we are convinced is not telling us what we think is the truth, we are taught to resort to the same tactics that we do with a suspect. So with witnesses, we are using the same interrogation tactics that can produce false confessions to oftentimes produce false witness statements. So the problem is a lot bigger than just- I, I get that. Let me ask you, tell me if you would, um, in, if I understood part of your, what, what you were trained in a particular interrogation technique or style, and you've written about your training and have offered, I think, a critique of that style based upon your experience. Is that right? That's correct. What, how were you trained? What's the training called? Well, the underlying, the overall training, because like I said, I've been through several classes, is basically what they call the accusatory approach. And the godfather of the accusatory approach, the, the people who teach it uh, the most throughout this country, and if you take any other classes, it's based on their uh, formula. It's called the Reed technique. Okay. And was that the, and one of the things that I think that you brought up with us, which I think is so interesting, is you are sharing with us that you used, you used this technique. And again, I'm not here to to be critical, I'm here to, we're here to talk about this stuff, but you use this technique, it seems like in your, um, uh, in your work as a, as a detective. Absolutely. Uh, we weren't taught in any other technique really. And so it was the approach that we used all the time. Was this the technique that you discovered 
contributed to, uh, I think what you said was a, was a false confession. Is that the technique that you used? Yes, it was. And I want to see if I can, the, if I can bring up what is, is this the, is this the book that you're talking about that is, that is the, the most common, I don't know if it's the most up-to-date edition, but this is the technique that is the most commonly used in the one that you're talking about, which is the essentials of the read technique, criminal interrogation and confessions. Is that right? Yes, that's one of their shorter versions of their book. They actually have a much thicker uh, book that's in its fifth edition. <laughs> this, this short edition was, was plenty alarming to me when I read it. Um, you mean, and there's a longer edition that actually has even more information in it or more details, examples, quote unquote instruction. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And in fact, they have several different publications that kind of supplement the uh, longer edition as well. Okay. So let me get to this if I, so you use the, the read technique and the read technique or the things that were taught in the read technique, just to unpack what you said earlier, um, contributed to a false confession. Yes. Well, not only contributed, I think it, it actually set, set the, it helped to create the false confession. Because it convinced this woman, like I like I had mentioned before, that it was her that her best option of uh, that was out there. It, it was a very temporary perception, but she believed that her best option was to tell us what we believed to be the truth, even though it wasn't. Okay, and then after that, and then we're gonna after you you began to do more investigation, you looked into things further. You began to identify, uh, you identified a solid, you said, unshakable alibi, one that convinced you and other detectives that this was a false confession and she was, she was innocent and she should not be prosecuted. Is that right? That's correct. And thus began your journey to sort of figure out how it was that you got to that point, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, but your Jim, I'm going to I'm going to share my perspective. You're unique in that way. I think that what I've seen is that where there's forensic evidence and 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 physical evidence and alibi evidence and other contradictory evidence to what is a, a confession, even one that's recanted, there are th there are prosecutors and police officers that continue to try to protect that little confession. They they modify their theory. They change their theory of the case. They well, a lot of reasons for that. Tell uh, me that. Okay. Why? Well, one of the reasons is something that's very strong that is part of all of us is, like I said, confirmation bias. Once we, it's very hard to change once you become set in a theory, and so you start looking for excuses uh, and. Uh, there's the evidence to support your theory. Like in our case, like many, many other cases, the woman provided us with contradictory details, uh, things that just didn't make sense. So rather than analyze them, we did what most people do that I see in these cases. We explained them away. Oh, she's avoiding uh, taking responsibility. Oh, she's protecting somebody, that sort of thing. The other thing is, is that still the mindset is, like you had mentioned, it's hard for people to wrap their head around the fact that anybody would confess to a crime that they didn't commit because they feel that that's not something I would do. And the third thing is, is that the Reed people, like all of these other schools that are based on Reed, teach you that if you, that you follow their, uh, their instructions uh, as they teach it, then you will never, ever get a false confession. Which, of course, is like saying that if you eat perfectly healthy and you train and you're physically active and you diet and you run marathons, that you'll never keel over from, you know, the widow maker or never have a heart attack or never have a physical condition. And the reality is, is that that's just not everybody's different. Well, the reality is also is based on what they say about it. It's true because the first lesson of the read techniques, the first step is you don't interrogate innocent people. <laughs> okay, well, how, do you, how do you identify, how does one identify someone who comes into an into a room 
that is be identified that, by someone as innocent because I mean it's not like they're wearing a a sign on their head or like a flag pops up behind them that says like innocent. Oh, but they, they are. Do they are. That's part of the. Tra- that is a huge part of the training. Tell uh, me. The tell, us, tell us how. Is, yeah, more than half of the training in these schools is teaching the detective how they can become a human lie detector. They, wow. how, if you watch a person's body language, if you listen to the way that they answer questions, that you uh, listen to how they respond to a set of like 17 different questions that you can determine whether or not they're being deceptive or whether or not they're guilty. But you can uh, make these things whatever you want, right? I mean, you well, can make it. Um, well, first off, it's all pseudoscience. It's as Reed says himself. I, I hate to even... Can we just can we just call it it's all bullshit as opposed to yeah. su- I mean I know pseudoscience gives it like a, like there's actually some scientific basis for it but I, it's junk science it's nonsense it's uh, decades, it, decades of like research. a misa so right. but decades, ahead, decades of research has shown that it doesn't work however we are identifying who we're going to interrogate which witnesses we're going to believe uh, things along that line based on something that just that that is no better than the flip of a coin. All right, let's talk about this. I want you, I believe that you have, you've written a book about this subject, about how the police generate false confessions. Yes. Right. And in your book, you talk about, um, you, you give us a history of interrogations and you give us a history of interrogations the work of interrogations, the work of the police, the history in a way, which is going to be very interesting how you, I thought it was fascinating how you tie current techniques and the desire for a confession above all else, how you tied that to, I know this is going to, people are going to be, minds are going to be blown, but how you tie that to all the way back to like medieval sort of, um, uh, what do you want to call them? I mean, they're not kangaroo courts, but they were, they were, I mean, they were essentially confess and you'll be saved. And so the only option was to confess. Yes. Like from the movie um, Braveheart, where, you know, I mean, where they say to, to what's his name? William Morris, you know, played by, um, what's his name? Uh, you remember the movie from Braveheart? I do. I do, yes. Yes. And he's laid out there and he's like, confess your sins. And then he, does, he says, you know. He doesn't. And then they torture him. And then they say, confess your sins and you shall be saved. And he doesn't. And they say, you want, then they drag him, put him on a rack. And then he doesn't. And at one point he yells freedom and they lean in and remember that? And they ask him like, Hey, can you wait? The prisoner wants to have a word, one word. And it all stops. Just ask for mercy. And then he yells out freedom. And then that's how they did it. Yeah. They made the option to confess to a crime less painful in that moment. The only option to avoid more physical and emotional pain. And it, it's pretty much the same principle today, except you're not using physical tactics. It's more emotional and um, that's the emotional manipulation of the, the person and the narrowing of their choices. It's like a very high pressure sales technique. Think Mel of it, Gibson. I, Mel Gibson is a guy. Mel Gibson. Mel, was Gibson, a yes. Mel Gibson. But think of a high pressure salesman. He's I, telling you that if you don't take advantage of this right now, you're going to lose this opportunity forever. That you're going to lose out on this benefit. It's you know so it, it's it very much follows across. And we've all been talked into making very poor decisions by high pressure salesmen who are very quick talkers. And who don't give you a chance to kind of sit back and analyze what are my real options. So let's 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 take a step back. You said it all begins with this behavioral, what's it called? Behavioral analysis interview. The the yeah. is it BAI, which is total nonsense. But in your book, you actually wrote about a uh, and your book is available on Amazon, right? Yes. And okay. Uh, and we'll talk about that back too, so it's cheaper. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you gave an example of how, in a way, how sort of nonsense this was that uh, David Simon's book, Homicide, A Year on the Killing Streets, which was uh, a Baltimore Sun reporter 
was embedded in the Baltimore homicide unit for about one year. And the book in, in hit that book, you share experiences and observations that David Simon documented where he was documenting behavioral patterns that the investigators would use to detect deception. In other words, to identify that somebody wasn't innocent right. to move from that phase to the next phase. Right. Yes. Okay. And what were those consistent? Uh, oh, no. I mean, like if you behaved one way, like if you were with the, it's uncooperative, that means that you were being deceptive. But if you were too cooperative, you were also being deceptive. Uh, if you didn't look at the person, the, the, the detective, as you were being interviewed, you were being deceptive. If you stared him in the, straight in the eye, you were being deceptive. So it's basically, you see what you're looking for. So, so if you go in there with a preconceived notion, that's what it's gonna end up. And you can write it any way you want. Like you can just choose to write the script any way you want. You can just, it's basically damned if you do and damned if you don't. So if you enter into the room, I used to always, so if the person's uncooperative, they are, they, detectives can use that as a sign that they need to move from this behavioral analysis to an interrogation. That's if correct. Too cooperative. If they talk too much or talk too little, if they get their perfect story, their story perfectly straight, or they, they fuck their story up. Right. If they blink too much or don't blink, if they avoid eye contact or they stare any, it's just whatever you want. So it's all based on what the officer thinks at that moment in time. And, you know, it's interesting because Reed has actually come out that they're now saying that there are certain indicators or certain characteristics that might make this analysis not as accurate. And they start talking about juveniles, people with you know, mental health histories or disabilities, uh, addicts, things along that line. And when I talk about this to my colleagues and I have this slide up there, I tell them, I don't know about you, but that's like 90 percent of my suspect and witness pool. I right read there. that. I'm blown away. So these are things that even Reed says you call it the small print. It's like okay. use of medications by the subject, mental illness, antisocial personality, low intelligence, low social responsibility and or maturity, young children, the emotional condition of the suspect, cultural differences. I mean, that describes a huge swath of, of the public. And you said about 90% of your, the people that, whether they were suspects or witnesses that you ended up interviewing. Yes. That's almost everybody. Just about. And um, the thing is, when I, you mentioned I said it was a fine print. And the reason I said it was a fine print is you can find this in their literature. You can find it buried deep in their textbooks. However, when it comes to the class where the detective is sitting there getting the instruction, it doesn't come up. It's not mentioned. Or if it is mentioned, it's blown over so quickly um, that, that nobody really picks up on it. What's and, the room? What, what is the... So Describe the room for me, because the read technique, as far as I understand, has and I has there. You've called this something similar to like a, a high pressure sales interview, you know, where people go on vacation, they end up going into like a timeshare thing. They get pushed from the per, first person all the way down to the last person, high pressure sales. And by the time they're they're done within an hour, they've walked out and signed up for a timeshare that is virtually unbreakable, unshakable, that they're locked into. They've agreed to go to like Acapulco in July, <laughs> you know what I mean? For the rest of their life. So um, tell me about the, and those things, in my opinion, those sorts of timeshare, those high sales settings where there's a high pressure sales, there's a method. There's a system that's used. That's why they would have really intelligent people would often be could could end up agreeing to like from the boiler room or from you know those days where they would push penny stocks on people because high pressure sales create an environment in which it's a script it's a play and they create an environment using all of their tools and this script to encourage people's their emotional and social defenses their self-defense mechanisms to break down. Plus, they also put a time constraint on it, too. 
if you walk out of this room today, if we don't get your side of the story today, if you don't tell us that you did it out of, uh, of self-defense or whatever, then you lose the opportunity for me to help you. So and when the police decide at some point during, during this first part of, a, of an interview, this behavioral analysis interview, um, and they decide that the person, because of whatever uh, arbitrary sign is is no longer innocent but is guilty um when what happens is there like a timeout is there a does something happen that before the interrogation begins well sure i mean they pretty much have a script and a lot of detectives don't follow it exactly in fact very few people do but it's the principles steps are still there. Typically what you're supposed to do is once you've done your 20 or 30 minute interview where you've determined that the person is guilty, you then walk out, let them sit in this interview room by themselves and kind of like think about the error of their ways. That's designed to help increase their anxiety. When you come back in, then you typically have a big folder with you with all sorts of papers in it, uh, some DVD disc, things like that. It could be empty, but uh, it could be blank. But the purpose is to show this it is my false. It could be just a, there could be no file at all. Right. Absolutely. You could have picked up a bunch of papers that you you know found on the that were uh, menus from local restaurants and just tucked it into a file. It could be a DVD from a. Uh, a fellow officer's wedding over the weekend. Absolutely. Right? And what's the so, purpose of that? What's the, what is that? What's the purpose of that, of that fight? That is, that is the beginning of showing the person the strength of the evidence against them right there. This is, you know, this is the evidence that we have. We've done a thorough investigation and, you know, all this evidence that's in here is against you and shows us that you are the person who committed this crime. Even if that's not true, even if it's total nonsense and even it's total BS. Nonsense. And the because, courts have said that's okay. Because the way I'm going to start is once I walk in with that big folder, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that our investigation, ours, because it's a big, big investigation, our investigation has proven that you committed this crime. All the evidence is there. There is nothing that you can say that's going to change our mind. All we want to know is why. Now, are these like big, this is, there's a set, there's a room size, the size of the room. Now, when you and I are talking right here, we have, we have some, um, obviously we have some, we have some physical, we don't have physical proximity because we're not even in the same room. We're doing this over the internet. Um, Interviews aren't conducted in, uh, excuse me, interrogations of this sort are not conducted in like in, in big living rooms in big lounges, right? No, the room is supposed to be barren. It's not supposed to have anything on the walls, not supposed to have any windows whatsoever, no clocks, so that you have no perception as to the passage of time or anything. Uh, There's a table, maybe like a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 size room. Uh, There's gonna be a table there, and there's going to be the room, the chair for the suspect. And a lot of times that chair is actually bolted onto the floor so that they cannot move it while your chair has wheels on it so that you can move it back and forth and change your proximity to the suspect. Uh, I put up a picture here. Yeah. Is this fairly emblematic of the sort of interview room where an an interrogation would, would take, I mean, I understand that each police department is different, but is this fairly typical? It is very, very typical. Yes. Very small table. Mm-hmm. Suspect is is jammed into a corner. So, of course, he's technically free to leave. Arguably, he could cut it off at any time. But look at how close look how close the detective is to him. He's almost like an invasion of his physical space. And you're taught to do that. You're taught uh, to move in during key moments in order to help increase the anxiety uh, right there. Um, so- in this chair, you can see exactly as you point out, the looks like the suspect's chair here is like a like your typical kind of, you know, I don't know what you call it, like a little portable chair. And the detective's chair is one that looks like it has like arms and probably rolls around. Right. I mean, this is like a 10 by 10 room. And that's the size of the room that the read technique says that they want people to use. Right. Yes. 
I mean, how is it any different? I mean, I don't know if you've been in a jail cell, but how is it any different from a jail cell in terms of its size? Well, a jail cell is probably has more open, <laughs> has at least bars that you can see through. Here, everything's closed up. And, and so this, like I said, you don't, you, this is you another don't, diagram, right? As another yeah. diagram where there claim to be some observer. And a lot of these is not even like an observer. There's just, there's the suspect sitting here and the interrogator. This desk gives people like this desk here gives people oftentimes a feeling of, of separation, of a barrier. And the detective moves around here so that there's no, no barrier. Right. That's the key. You don't want the person to have anything that they can feel that they can hide behind. And so that's why the desk it, is off to the side and the interrogator is right in front of them. It's, it's unbelievable to me. Tell me if you would. So you're saying that the, the, there, there are nine steps, right, to the read technique. Is it, well, there's, there's nine principles. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Some I'm of them are put them kind of redundant, here. you know. I'm going to put them up here and I want you, because you were telling us a second ago about how once you come in with your file and you use the, everything is designed to, to increase the, the subject's anxiety. Yes. And everything is designed to encourage that subject to think that in this moment, like I need the only way out of here is I can't run through and physically assault the officer. The only way out of here is I need to reduce. It's designed to reduce your self-defense mechanisms, which would tell you not to talk or may tell you to tell the truth. And it's designed, which that will only increase your anxiety. So and the thing about it is, if you want to get up and walk out, what does that mean? That increase, because if you leave, I'm going to create this perception that if you leave, it's going to make you look even guiltier. So people have a tendency, they want to stay there. They don't want to leave until I'm convinced that they're innocent. And that's something that, that we use to get past Miranda and to get and to keep them talking. I found this, which is. The whole focus of the interrogation technique is to manipulate the subject's anxiety. Yes. So the way that I try to understand this is it would be natural for a person to say, I'm not talking to you or I didn't do it. Yes. And so your, your defense would be, I don't want to, the consequences of, conf, of being guilty of the offense or confessing to it would typically cause a person to to, to take on that role, to, to push back against the officer. Yes. But the officer's job is to, to manipulate that so that the fear of being deceptive is the, the, the fear of, of the consequences of confessing actually what? It, it, explain that to me. It becomes less than the fear associated with the person remaining deceptive. Is that it? Yes, because what I'm doing is I'm going to go in there and tell you that we, I know that you did it. The evidence is there. All I want to know is why. And then I'm going to start giving you justifications for why you did it. And, you know, typically that, that they say that they should be moral or psychological justifications, but way too often they become legal justifications of, you know, did you do a typical case, let's say that we're talking about theft of money from a cash register. Did you take the money because the cash register was open and anybody would have been tempted? Did you take the money because you're behind on your bills and you're under a lot of stress? You know, that sort of thing. So what happens when I say, I didn't do it? Hold on. Detective train him, a detective train him. I didn't do it. I didn't Hear do me it. Out. Hear me out. Did you do it because we know you did it? If I didn't do it. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Just listen to me. Let, listen to me. We know you did it. Did you do it because? If you did, that's understandable. We got to talk about that. But you to see what I'm doing? I'm telling you, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. I, I keep blocking your denials because the more you deny, the harder it's going to be to get you to move to a confession. So, what, so what do you mean blocking denials? Well, as when you start to deny or you start to explain, I'll say, wait a minute, hold up. Just listen to what I'm trying to say. And then I'll go into these themes, these different excuses. Now, they have a book of over 2,000 different themes that, you, that they can use from anything from animal abuse to murder. 
And so you don't need to have a lot of different themes. You can repeat them over and over and over and but over. But the theme is never, okay, maybe you're just, you're innocent and you're just, you're sticking to your, 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 your you, you know you're innocent and you are passionately and vociferously standing up for yourself. That's not one of the themes. That is not one of the themes. And that's where the read approach actually encourages confirmation bias. Because I am no longer seeking information from you. I am no longer seeking any explanation from you whatsoever. I'm seeking an admission where you're going to tell me that you did it. I mean, this is so fucked up. You got a guy jammed into a corner. You got an officer who's got fake of a fake file. He's using this collective we like there's some big investigation by a whole department to make the person feel like it's, you know, a, a giant investigation with multiple people who've weighed in on this person's guilt. He's now in this little corner. He's penned in and the detective is not is unwilling to hear any denial. I mean, won't even hear it. Just keeps cutting him off. I mean, I, I, the fact that this just continues, that it's it it's I mean, it's torture. Well, it's also, like psychological. I know it's not physical torture, but it feels like psychological waterboarding that at some point people are just going to give in to just end it. Yes. And that's why you read is actually very, very effective. And if you have the right person, then, you know, you, you have a good chance of getting a confession. But the problem is if, if you have the wrong person, you're still using the techniques to get them to admit to what you've already determined is the truth. And that's the danger right there. Let me ask you about these. So the first is you come back in with your file, you confront the suspect with it can be fake evidence or the this massive investigation that that absolutely confirms their guilt is a thousand percent certain. We're no longer questioning your guilt. Right. We know you're guilty. Train them. It's un, un, indisputable. Right. Right. And you then begin to develop themes to excuse the crime. What yeah. do you mean by themes to excuse the crime? Now, all the while, this guy's still penned in the corner and the officer's like this physical, uncomfortable space. But what do you mean themes to excuse the crime? But I'm suggesting or I'm saying that they could have committed the crime for less, you know, for reasons that people would understand that, you know, look, this is a very bad thing that you did. But if you did it for a reason that, that we can understand, what does that infer? Like I didn't steal the bread, train him. I'm telling you, I didn't take the bread from the from the store. I didn't do it. I didn't take the bread. We know you did it. Did you take it because you had a family to feed and you were out of money and you really needed to get them some food? If you if that's what happened, tell us because people can understand that. People but I didn't do that. It. What's the other alternative that I'm just a piece of shit and I just took bread that for comes no later reason? On. Now that comes later on. At some point. You know, the thing is, one of the other themes, too, that they kind of do is, look, was this a spur of the moment thing or did you plan it? If it's a spur of the moment thing, we, you know, that's what I think happened because you were just not thinking at the time and you just reacted. Uh, but at one point, they do what they call the alternative question. And that is, OK, listen, we've been in here for three hours now. We know you did it. Uh, we have no doubt the evidence is there. Um, now you either did it for one of two reasons. You either did it because you're a low life dope fiend who doesn't give a shit about anybody and you stole that money. Or if that's the case, I'm out of here. I don't want anything else to do with you. Or you did it. You took the money because you were hungry. You, um, the cash register drawer was open. It was a spontaneous thing. And you were going to pay it back anyway. If that's the case, tell me. But if it's not, it has to be the other one. And then I'm gone. So what is it? So you're given two choices. That, and, now we're, and, and we're talking about this over the course of like a, of a, of a few of a minutes or, or an hour, you and I. But these interrogations where a person is in that physically uncomfortable setting where they're they, they aren't get, being given a chance to, to, to deny it because those are all being interrupted. And the detective is saying, this is a certainty. We know it. 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 This just continues and continues until the person does what? 
until they get to the point where, oh, you're right. I took it because it was a spur of the moment thing, that sort of thing. Now, remember, not only can I lie about this big binder, I can lie about other evidence as well. I can say, look, we have three witnesses who saw you take that money. You know, they've signed documents saying that you took the money and you're starting to think, oh, my God, you know, mistaken identity or whatever happened. So I'm lying to you about how strong the case is. And I can also a lot of times the inference is, look, you know, what would if you were me, if you were the judge, what would you think? You know, we have all this evidence against you and here you are denying it. But, you know, people want you to take responsibility. People want you to be responsible. If it's a spur of the moment, take responsibility and just say that you did it. And we people understand that sort of thing. So and this goes on. It's a monologue. I'm the one doing all the talking and it can go on. Now, over time, since Reed has modified some of their positions, not the core ones, but some of them. And one of the things is over time, they now say, because of all the false confessions that result from hours and hours and hours worth of interrogation, they now are saying, well, if, you, if it's like three or four hours and they're still adamantly denying, then maybe you should rethink uh, your position. Three or four hours is a long time. Now, what's funny let's, about that- Let's compare. Let, let's, I want people to understand because it, we're talking about these- I know we've talked about three or four hours, but I want somebody to visualize a people complain about baseball. <laughs> right. You know, where I'm yeah. going with this. They complain yeah. that baseball takes too, too, too much time. Right. So if you want to talk about three or four hours, picture an entire baseball game from the, the, as you're in the seat on the warm up seat from the, the warm ups to the guys throwing the ball around, you know, you know, throwing it around to, and, and playing catch all the way to the end of the game. And if it were four hours, that would be, I mean, you would sit there and after some point you would say, I got to get up. Like, I got to leave. Like I, 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 right. And if someone said you're not, basically if they gave you the impression you're not leaving. Or is that in your best interest to leave? Because if you leave, even worse things will happen. So Pete, you might just sit there. Yeah. Three or four hours is an, inc I mean, imagine being in a car when, and just think about when you're in a car for three or four hours, people shift around, they change the music, they, you know, they, they want some solitude. Three or four hours in that setting, in that small room that we talked about, where you're not even giving a chance to say, to deny it, to assert your innocence, you're just being cut off and cut off, you're being presented with evidence and fake evidence and, and representations and lies. It, again, I'm not saying that all, that all, interrogations, but they're allowed to, to use lies. Eventually a person's will, their willpower just breaks down. Yes. And that's what it's that's the goal. To. That's the goal. That is, that is the goal. Now I know that one of the things that when I'm questioning witnesses, that it's one of the things that, that is, is difficult for people is it's hard for people to quarrel with their own words and that's one of the reasons why confessions are so desirable as a detective or a prosecutor, because no matter how bad the evidence is, no matter how um, um, weak the investigation was, no matter how um, unconvincing the circumstantial evidence is, a confession just sounds like, OK, I know all that, but he, he admitted it. And the thing about it is, is that these admissions have the details that as we say, only the true killer would know. How? And how, how do we get to that point in this process, Jim? We tell them. We tell them, we provide them with the details. It's not oftentimes, a lot of times it's not obvious, but we do it in very subtle ways. Um, you mean an example? Well, well, first off, realize that you're an innocent person you want to escape this situation. You are now convinced that the only way that you can do it and get help from me and from the court and all that kind of stuff is to provide a believable story, but you weren't there. So how do you figure it out? Well, one, reason, one way is by me asking you leading questions. These are questions that, has, that have some information about the crime 
contained within the question. It might be, did you do it this way or this way? Like a yes, no type question. If you guess wrong, I'm going to tell you that you're lying. So what does that do? You now know that that's the wrong answer and you're going to change your answer over time. Just as an example, let's say, <laughs> sorry. No, no, don't worry about <laughs> it. Let me give him something real quick. You got a great Dane, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> there was. There you go. Your dog is named Watson? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, for Dr. Watson. <laughs> yeah, I figured as much. But um, um, let's say that we're talking about... <laughs> Could we hold on for one second? Let me get it. Get him something. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Now, see, if this were an actual interrogation, um, Jim would have no opportunity if he were the suspect to leave and go walk out of the room. At some point, even if his dog was sitting there pacing and and running around or was scratching at the door. I, if I were the detective, would be telling him that, um, that I know, and he, he knows, I know that he wants to get out of that room. I know he wants to go do something else. I know that he wants to go take care of his dog. And instead of saying, hey, why don't you go take a break and go take care of your dog? I tell him, look, man, I, we know you did it. We know it. We know it. And you know, it would just be best for you if you would just tell us. Just I admit. And then, what would, and then what would happen is, Jim, if you were in that situation, would be evaluating the fact that his dog is out there suffering and, 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 and wanting company or wanting to eat or wanting to go to the bathroom or destroying the rest of his house. And his, his wife would be mad if he was, wasn't tending to the dog. And so I'm, of course, got him cornered in the room. And I'm telling him that I'm not saying, listen, you can go take care of your dog once you tell me, once you, you admit that you did it. But I know that's what he wants to do. So what I do instead, according to this technique and this setup, is that I use what I know he wants to do, which is to go take care of his dog. And I use that as a way to encourage him to admit to me that he committed the crime. So come on, Jim, just tell me. Just tell me and we can move on to the next step. Just admit, I know what you did. We know it. It's not in question. And he's thinking, I just want to get the fuck out of here and go take my dog outside so it doesn't destroy my house. And then as soon as he's out there, once he confesses to a crime he knows you didn't commit, he walks outside and goes takes his dog out and he thinks he wants to correct it. He wants to recant and tell me that, hey, I, I just did that just to because I couldn't have the, my dog destroy the house. I was just using your example of how in a read technique or in an, in an interrogation, if that was something that you knew, if I was in the same room with you as a detective and you were the suspect and you knew you needed to go take care of your dog, I wouldn't let you, I mean, I wouldn't physically hold you in the room, but I would emotionally create barriers to you leaving the room to go tend to your business. And you would feel the mounting anxiety of feeling like I need to go take care of this. Otherwise it's going to be a problem. Sure, Neil, I did it. You got it. I was there. Where do I sign? And you think I'll just, just I just got to get out of here. And that's kind of the. Yes. And a lot of times people will think, well, the follow up investigation will clear me. They're talking about they're going to test the DNA evidence. And I know that's going to exonerate me, but there might not be any DNA evidence. They've lied about that. And you and 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 along the way, despite the fact that they get some details from the detectives, they ultimately end up. um You've had cases where you later discover that those details were that 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 they were innocent. You've yes. seen cases where they were innocent, even though they provided some details about the about the crime. Right, and like I said, there's basically two types of details uh, that you're looking for when you're looking at confessions: details that the detective knew about the crime and details that the detective did not know about the crime that they could then later go out and prove. Now, those are gold. That's great cooperation. Like if I tell you, yeah, I shot the guy and the gun's up in the attic behind the Christmas decorations and you go there and you find the gun, that's really good cooperation. But if I'm only giving you details that you already know, 
Now, are they coming from me or am I getting them from you? And when before interrogations were videotaped, it was hard to figure that out sometimes. But now that they're being videotaped, you can oftentimes see how the detective is suddenly, suddenly you know, very, you know, it's just feeding those that information in bits and pieces. And it be kind of kind of becomes so the person says, Well, I was driving a white car. Well, and, and the car was really blue. What right. how would it go? It's a, maybe it was a blue car. That's yeah. Uh, and you could actually see that. Or like, okay, I saw the person. The person was driving a white car and you go, really? Are you sure? And you go, well, maybe it was dark and I just couldn't see it. And I want people to try to, I, I want listeners to try if they can, because when you hear it being described in another scenario that you're not a, a part of, that you don't have like emotional con congruence with, or you don't, you're not getting emotionally in touch with the with the way that the, the subject felt at that time. It's hard to understand, but I want people to imagine taking a pill. You have to take your, your blood pressure pill or your, um, uh, pick another one, your blood thinner every morning, or you have to turn off your stove before you leave. And you get in the car and you start, and somebody, can actually cause you to begin to doubt whether you did that. We've all been there over something as nominal as that. Yeah. I'm sure exactly. you turned turn the stove off, Jim? I did. You're positive. Well, it's the thing about it is, is that there's, when you're talking about this, there's two types of false confessions. One is the one where I know it's a false confession. I'm just giving you back the information that you want to hear so that I can stop this. And that's because called a, a, com, a coerced compliant confession? Yes. But okay. there are a lot of cases, and this is really counterintuitive, where I you convince me that there's a possibility that I did it. I don't remember. I don't remember doing it, but you're telling me that these things happen. You have the evidence. And so I start to think, well, maybe did I black out? Uh, or whatever along that line. Maybe the crime was, and sometimes these say that this is even suggested by the detective, how, you know, that this was such a horrific event. Maybe you blocked it from your mind. You know, maybe you just don't remember that part. But, you know. It's so insidious, I can't even stand it. I want to just, I want to punch somebody that is <laughs> it's capable of, of doing this. You want to, when we watch these videos of interrogations, I, you know, we want to jump through the screen and like, you know, stop it. I'm sure you've had that experience. And the thing is, anybody can go on YouTube. There's tons of these you know, false confessions out there on YouTube these days. And I think one of the most dramatic one, even though he hasn't been exonerated yet, is Brendan Dassey, the 16-year-old uh, from the Making the Murderer uh, series. And if you watch how they're feeding him the information, how they're manipulating him and getting him to... When you ask the question, who is telling the story, you can see it's the detectives and they're, you know, m keep manipulating him until he gives them the right answer. They latch on to the right answer and then they move on to the next one where they again manipulate him until he gets to the and, right answer. There. And I want I want I want to use it as an example. And there's another example that you use in your book that you talk about a lot. So people, of course, know about the Central Park Five. Um, who ultimately were uh, convicted of taking part in what was called wilding um, in, uh, in New York that resulted in the, the brutal attack on a, on a jogger. And these young men, we've seen the movie or the, the documentary or the, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the movie that was based on it. We've read the articles. These men were ultimately exonerated eventually. Um, and those cases all involved false confessions, all. Um, and then, and everybody who watched that show, I think was moved by the Central Park Five, but that happens in other cases. And one that you talked about was, I think you called them the, the Norfolk Four. Norfolk Four cases, yes. Tell me about that case. Well, that was a case where there was a sailor's wife. He was out 
at sea. He was due to come home the next day. Uh, when he does come home, uh, he finds his wife murdered and raped in the bedroom. So the police, there's no, really no signs of forced entry there, you know, that sort of thing. So they actually asked one of the woman's friends, who do you think could have done this? And uh, she talked about this one guy. Um, and then she talked about the sailor who lived across the hallway. She said that he always kind of look, kept looking at her funny. So they went and they snatched the sailor up. Uh, they asked him if he would just come in and cooperate. They brought him downtown, and in a matter of hours, they had him confess to the um, rape and murder of the sailor's wife. Um, now, part of the problem- The story gets worse. The story gets worse from here. Oh, it gets worse. Well, first off, he got it wrong. He said he beat her to death with a shoe. Well, they did get the autopsy report back, and she was stabbed. So they came back and said, hey, wait a minute. She wasn't beat to death with a shoe. She was stabbed. And so they got him to sign a second confession where he said he stabbed her. Well, case plus he said he forced entry. There's no sign of forced entry or any of this stuff. So they figure case closed, the DNA is going to match. Well, lo and behold, the DNA doesn't match. So what they do is they then go, they have to modify their theory. They then go to his roommate and they get him to confess. And he now, gives a totally they, different story. I mean, this story has so many layers to it, but the DNA didn't match. And we've all heard about DNA exonerations. That should have been it. Like, there should have been the end of it. Well, like I said, they had an alternative explanation for that. If he didn't do it, there must have been other people. And eventually, seven people, only four of which confessed, the confessions were totally different, but there were seven people involved in this thing. And so after... A while they're getting ready for trial and all this other kind of stuff. And the police get a uh, visit from this woman who said that, yeah, I got a, a letter from my boyfriend. Here it is. And in the letter, he admits to having raped and murdered this woman, the sailor's wife. And it turns out that it was a guy who they originally was told the other alternative suspect. So they went to talk to him and they got his DNA and it did match. And so they told him, you know, he said, look, I did it by myself. I don't know what these other guys are saying. They're a bunch of fools, but I committed the crime by myself. So they told him, no, 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 no. Look, we know these guys did it. We know they confessed. So if you want to avoid the death penalty, then you better come clean and tell us what really happened. He goes, okay, my bad. I'm out walking in the parking lot and these seven drunk sailors come out of this building and they asked me, I don't know if they're from Adam, but they asked me, let's go in and rape this woman. And all of us did. And, and so that, I, I mean, a convoluted story. I mean, it's just so many twists and turns. But what's in, also interesting is that the lead detective, he's actually serving jail. Let's see a jail a prison sentence right now because he was taking money from inmates and telling judges that they were cooperating with him to help get their sentence reduced. So I can't even, are there, are there countries that use other methods that don't and have prohibited? There are countries that use other methods and have prohibited this type of interrogation in their legal system. Am I right? Many, many countries, but mostly to begin in the UK because they had a major issue with false confessions. They realized it back in the seventies and all that. So they actually brought in researchers and people to study the problem. And they realized that they were using the read style approach, the read technique. And they said, oh my God, this is horrible. And they cut it out totally. And in fact, using the read technique is considered to be a human, to be a human rights violation in the UK right now using those tactics. So what they did was they came up with a interview approach because they don't call it an interrogation because they're not looking for a confession. They're getting information from the, subs from the suspect. They're not going in there and accusing them. They have this, actually it's a scientific approach based on the way that we relate to people, that we communicate and that we, to remember things. 
and it's a structured approach. And so they go in there and their goal is, like I said, information, not a confession. And since then, that approach has been, has, um, been taken up by other countries. And also it's now beginning to gain a little bit of a foothold here in the U S. Well, I, I hope it, that that continues. Um, I am curious, the Norfolk four, have they been, has the legal system let, let them go? Are they, they have finally been exonerated. Yes. It happened. How many years later? Oh my God. It, this was back in the nineties, uh, or so. And it was, uh, just in the last few years. Unbelievable. They were exonerated. It's unbelievable. Jim, um, I, I could probably talk about this. I probably am going to want to revisit this subject with you and uh, in the future and and hopefully maybe have some clips where we can bring some clips from YouTube and show people how, walk them through how this technique is actually used. And you could give us some, point out to people how, you know, they can, how this happens. Absolutely. And, you know, if someone's listening to this, could you do me, um, could you do us all a, a public service? What can a person do if they find themselves in a situation where they're being interrogated and they are, what should they do? And they're, and they're not being believed and they're beginning to feel that there's no way out other than to just go with it. If you're in any situation, even if you believe that you're just a witness who is helping the police in their investigation, anytime you get the least bit of suspicion that they're accusing you or that they're asking you any sort of questions along that line, you stop immediately and say, I want a lawyer. Don't. Now, that's important. Don't say, Can, do you think I should have one? Or yeah. Because that will just play right into the detective's hands. Because once you say, I want a lawyer, they have to stop. But if you kind of dance around it, maybe I should talk to a lawyer. What do you think? That sort of thing. They do not have to stop. It's the, the law is very specific about that. You have to be very specific. Okay. I think that's a very important tip. I want to end our discussion on that point because um, there's just so much. I mean, this is just, you know, this is. It's counterintuitive, but yet it's not counterintuitive. If people put themselves in the in that mindset of the mindset and the uh, the emotional position and the the physical fear and the fear of the consequences of the world learning that you're being investigated for X, Y, and Z, and all of that, it, all of that can lead up and contribute to a person being manipulated into either believing they committed the crime or just admitting to it, just to dial the pressure down and to get out of that room. Um, and it's counterintuitive, but I, again, I go back to what I said in the beginning, people do it every day, even in little small things. And if you don't think that that's, that somehow your emotional, psychological, cognitive makeup is different when you're dealing with a small thing, oh, I would just Sure, I would just admit to not cutting the, not turning the, the sprinkler on just so I could just end the conversation and just move on. If you think that somehow you're not vulnerable, you're able to do it there, but somehow in a more serious moment where the stakes are as high as they could be with seasoned veterans and people who are trained in a, in a physical setup that's designed to, to encourage you to feel more anxiety and more guilt than you know, you, you, you need to read Jim's book. And I, I want you to tell me, Jim, where can people, first of all, how can they get in touch with you and learn more about what you do? Let's start there. Well, my email address is james.trainum at yahoo.com. Okay. And, and Trainum is, is, we can see it on the screen here, uh, but james.trainum at yahoo.com. And do yes. you have a website? I do not. Um, I'm very low tech when it comes to that. But if anybody wants to talk about this, if they want more information, I can blow up their inbox with all sorts of, uh, <laughs> of uh, you know, papers that they can read and places that they can go, other websites that they can look at that helps to explain uh, this phenomenon. And Jim, tell me about, I, I put your book up before. Um, it's a I've read the book. I have it here. I have the, 
the Kindle version of the book. Tell me again, um, what is your book called and where is it? I'm going to put it up here on the screen so people can see it. What is it? uh, What's it called? Where is it available? What's the cost? How the police generate false confessions. Uh, It's basically written. It's it's not an academic book whatsoever. It's written for the general public so that they have an understanding of not only the uh, physical way that we generate false confessions, but the mindset of the police. But also it has a part in there where the person can learn how to evaluate a confession and what the police should be doing once they get the confession that they so often don't do. Um, And it's available on Amazon. I know that it's on paperback. The hardback edition is way too expensive. So go for the paperback or the Kindle. I'm not sure of the cost right now though. I think the Kindle version is like $10. Yeah. Which was in, it's a, it's a great read. It's not a, it's not like an academic read. It's a great read. I, sad to say, I'll, I'll say it's entertaining, but it's entertaining in a macabre way because we're dealing with real lives and and a and a real life, um, real life experiences. Jim, I found this that I'm going to end on here. I saw this, which I thought was just sort of as a as an incredible political kind of cartoon about confessions. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen it before. I haven't. That's that's very good. I like that. And as you can see, we've got one detective sort of, you know, encroaching on the space of the suspect or a witness, and we've got someone else. And obviously it's designed to look like a marionette or a puppet. Um, this is a super important topic because the legal system, in my opinion, is making it harder and harder and harder um, for us to be able to present the science of false confessions. Um, Confessions are so desirable. They're so wanted. They're so protected by the powers that be that there are cases that prohibit some scientists. There are cases that limit what some witnesses can say. There are cases that limit what, you know, they think that it's just within the, well, it's within the everyday experience of the juror to know what's a truthful statement or not. And of course, that's not true because we need people like Jim to, to explain how this, this psychological warfare, I'll call it that, sort of is being, being levied um, um, against you know, people who are vulnerable. Um, Jim, I can't thank you enough for appearing on cross-exam- or killer cross-examination. Um, I, I give you a lot of credit for looking back at your, the case that caused you to begin to question Um, how it was that your training and your devotion to public service and to solving crimes could have contributed in any way to to a a false confession and a a person being wrongly accused. And um, I'm going to certainly follow along in your journey as you continue to try to shed light on this and teach prosecutors, police officers, lawyers, and judges about how this is more than just a uh, 0.001% type thing. This is a real thing that occurs to real people and all of us are vulnerable to it. And I can't thank you enough for appearing on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.